Um, my name is Mark Essert. For those of you don't, who don't know me, I am majoring in middle level education, social studies and math, and I'm also in the pre sem program, so in other words, I'm crazy. So, <laughs> would you please join me as we begin the prayer? Lord God, Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us all to gather here tonight to hear your word, to sing praise to you. Lord, I pray that you would just bless our time that we get to spend here together as a family of faith, that you would bring us closer to one another and most especially closer to you as you feed us through your word. So just continue to be with us this night and just keep us always in your care. In your son's holy name I pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right. So our text from tonight comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 through 10. For we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling, if indeed by putting it on we may not be found naked. For while we were still in this tent, we groaned, being burdened, not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. He who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So we are always of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we are of good courage. And we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body whether good or evil. So, something that stuck out right away at me as I was reading through this text is probably something familiar to all of you. And that is the verse where it says, we walk by faith, not by sight. And we've probably heard that repeated to us over and over again. But I want to try and make us look at it in maybe a way that's challenging and that we've never looked at it before. And that is, first off, it's hard to walk by faith. And why is it so hard for us to walk by faith? And why does it say right afterwards not to walk by sight after it tells us to walk by faith? For most of us, we can all see. Our eyes work great. I know some of you probably don't have as good a vision, but we're all people that use our eyes every single day. We're a very visual generation, one of the most visual generations ever to walk this planet. We're constantly consumed by our eyes gathering information on our phones, in class. We get bored because we may not be visually stimulated. I know when I'm flipping through Facebook, I see stuff and I'm scrolling, kind of skimming half the time, not really paying attention to what's going on. And I see an article pop up and I'm like, oh, that looks interesting. Maybe read the little caption that's there and then decide that's not worth my time. And then I'll scroll a little farther and I'll find one. Oh, that looks even more interesting. I think I'm gonna read this one. So I'll click on it and I'll start reading the first sentence paragraph, and then I'll realize I got better things to do, such as keep scrolling through Facebook. <laughs> so, we're very visually stimulated, and we need constant engagement. It's something we crave and we long for, and that makes this life a whole lot more difficult, because we're so much more easily distracted, because it's so much more hard for us to focus. And so that's what makes that faith hard, because we can't see God. He is invisible to us. We don't have a point that we can look at and say, there he is. We have the cross, we have symbols. We don't have something concrete there that is God that we look to. We have paintings, images, things that we may think represent God, but we cannot see him. We have no physical proof that he ever existed. That's hard. How can you put in your faith in something you cannot see. It's hard to understand because we come across these different trials in our life, these things that come up, and we're wondering, God, what are you doing? I don't understand what's going on. It may be death in a family. It just might be stress. It could be a whole host of many different things that we face every single day, and we don't see what the point is. We're we're there, we're suffering through these different things in our life, and we can't see the end result. We have this little picture that is our lives that we look at every day. It's the only way in which we see our world is through our own eyes. We don't have a bigger picture. So we see this little picture and we don't get it because it's hard now and this affects me now. What's happening? What's the point? 
Why should I even trust you through this? Because right now I don't see how you're working in any way at all. It's difficult. How can we put our faith in something we cannot see as being such a visual generation? And yet we continue to long and seek out God. Because guess what? That little picture that we have, he can see it. But he can see everybody else in this room too. He sees how it all fits together in the most intricate puzzle in the universe of how our lives all interconnect and meet up and how we work with one another. He sees the big picture. He's seen it since the beginning of time and he sees it through to the end of time. And that's a crazy, incredible thing because we can't even fathom a scope more than just ourselves because we're so self-absorbed in our own perspective. And so we long to know the God that has those details, that gives us that information, who knows the plan that we have, that he has for us. And we have our own plans that we have for our lives, but ultimately, those are selfish. Those are hindered by our sin. But he has something greater in store. And also, we continue to seek him in that then, in that small picture that we have. We try to see where does he fit into this. But maybe we need to flip that around and think about where does our picture, or yes, where does our picture fit into his instead of his fitting into ours? Because as our text says, oh, let's see here. For in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling, if indeed by putting it on we may not be found naked. We're longing to be with God. We're longing to have those heavenly bodies that he is going to restore someday because these bodies were dead in our sin. We're stuck. They're imperfect. But when he comes and raises everybody, we're going to be given new bodies. We're going to be new, perfect individuals that can see, touch, taste. We are going to have a new, physical, perfect body. And we're longing for that. We're longing for that presence of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to be with him and serve him and praise him forever. But we're not there yet. And that's hard. That's what we're looking to. That's what we're hoping we have for us there. But we don't have that now. We long for that, but it's not here. The Israelites faced a similar situation when they were under exile. And we look to the text from Jeremiah chapter 29. And some of you probably will recognize one of the verses especially, but I want to give a further context to that as it really greatly parallels our text for today. So here I'm going to read that for you now. So Jeremiah chapter 29, starting with verse 1. These are the words of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem to the surviving elders of the exiles and to the priests, the prophets, and to all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. It said, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage, that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease. But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile, and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare you will find your welfare. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets and diviners who are among you deceive you, and do not listen to the dreams that they dream, for it is a lie that they are prophesying to you in my name. I did not send them, declares the Lord. For thus says the Lord, when seventy years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you, and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all places where I have driven you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you, declares the Lord. 
and, sorry, and bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. So, the Israelites are in a similar, similar situation that we're in. They're in exile. They're not in Jerusalem, the promised city of God. They're longing to be back in that place that God has given to them, to his people. But they're not there right now. And that's hard for them. They're groaning about it. They're struggling with it. They don't understand it. But yet God has given them to this time to be under exile. So what does God then tell them to do about it? So I think what blank is it? Okay. So the Israelites were in exile. We're here now. Heaven is there. They're longing for Jerusalem. But God calls them in their groaning state, in their exiled state, to have families, have sons and daughters, plant gardens, produce fruit, live where I have put you, be fruitful, live your life there, live a productive life there. He tells them not to decrease, and he says, this especially stuck out at me, but seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile, and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. So in this place where we groan and we struggle and we long to be with our Lord, he calls us to live full lives here, to live full lives in service for him, lives where we serve our neighbor whether that neighbor be someone who believes and shares our beliefs, or whether it be someone who we don't even know. We don't know what their beliefs are, where they've come from, but he calls us to be their neighbor. He calls us to pray for them, pray on behalf of them. And that's what we're to do here and now. We're to pray for our neighbors. We're to passionately live lives of service to them so that they too may come to know the saving faith that we have received in Christ our Lord. And how wonderful a faith is that, that we get to know that we do get to dwell with God in heaven someday, but we're not there yet. And so now I'm going to go back to the original text for tonight, because there's something that gives us great hope in that message. So for while we are still in this tent, while we are still here in this world, we groan, being burdened. Not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. He who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So we are always of good courage. God has given us his Spirit as a guarantee. The God who dwells in heaven cared enough about you to be part of you. To live inside of you here in this broken, sinful, burning world, this sinful body. He has sent his spirit to be with you. When you were baptized, when those amazing words were spoken, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. That was God putting his name on you. He reached down and he said, I want you as my child. I claim you, you are mine. You are forgiven. You're significant. I am with you, and I will not leave you, no matter what. I will go with you where you go. I dwell inside you. The power of the Spirit you have access to. The God who dwells in heaven dwells in you through the Holy Spirit. And how amazing, how incredible is that? That is the task that we are given, to share that good news with others, that they too may receive the Spirit of the Lord to dwell inside of them. <coughs> when we dwell here together in this broken world. But we look on with faith, a faith that we have no visual evidence of, but we walk in faith because we have been given faith because of that Holy Spirit that dwells in us. And that, my friends, is absolutely incredible because Jesus is the one doing all the work. Jesus is the one who claimed us, who took us into his fold, who gave us his spirit. All we do is receive, and all he does is give. How amazing is that, that we get to receive this great gift. 
So, we are to live full lives where we are, amidst our groaning, and even though we long to be with Jesus. But again, I repeat, we have that spirit. He has guaranteed us his spirit in your baptism. That's amazing. He dwells with us here. Through the trials that we'll face, when we cannot see what good is going to come out of whatever situation you're in now, he sees the big picture. He knows where you're going. He has a plan in store for you, a plan where you pray and you give thanks and you look to him for guidance. Not that we would look to our own path, but to his. He dwells with us. So even though we long to be with our God in our heavenly home, there is work to be done here and we are guaranteed that God will be with us. We are to walk by faith and not by sight. Please pray with me. Lord God, Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this guarantee of your spirit that you go with us all places, that you have named us and claimed us as your children, and that we have the honor of serving you. Help us to always look to you in faith, that we would not become distracted by the things of this world, but that we would look to you and to your plan, and that we would call upon you and praise you in our times of troubles and help and those joyous times in life. So just continue to be with us this day as we get to sing praise, as we get to pray. Lord, thank you for your spirit here and now. In your son's most holy and precious name, we pray. Amen. And now I'd like to leave you with the closing words that follow the Corinthians. And now, finally, brothers, rejoice. Aim for restoration. Comfort one another. Agree with one another. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all.